The shootings in Uvalde and Buffalo, remember Buffalo, have reignited the debate over gun violence in this country. This year alone, think about this for just a second, this is only May, this is only May, heading into June. There have been 214 mass shootings and at least 77 incidents of gunfire on school grounds. Again, this is May heading into June. Dr. Celine Gounder says using a public health approach could maybe help reduce gun violence and keep people safe. She's an epidemiologist and editor-at-large for public health at Kaiser Health News. Good to have you at the table, Dr. Gounder, once again. Public health approach, I don't think anybody thinks of it in those terms, but you say we need to start thinking of this as a public health crisis? That means that we start with the data. We study gun violence in this country, something that was actually very difficult to do because of something called the Dickey Amendment, which restricted the CDC's ability to do this very kind of research. So you need to know where are the guns, who are the people who are at risk, what are the risk factors, and how can we target those risk factors? You also say think about the words that you use. It's like when you're a kid growing up, your mother always says, use your words, watch your language. What do you mean by that? I think when we talk about gun control, that's a very limited set of options in terms of reducing gun violence. It's really controlling access to guns. We should be talking about gun violence prevention because there's a much wider range of things we can do. For example, uh, looking at safe gun storage, getting gun shop owners involved and educating their customers about safe gun storage and suicide, uh, community violence interruption programs. There's so many things we can do that work that actually are not about gun control. 18 states in the District of Columbia have what's called these red flag laws. What are they and how can they help? Red flag laws are really about taking guns out of the equation when somebody's in a moment of crisis. It's temporary. Uh, and families very often are in the best position to identify when a loved one is in crisis. Law enforcement, um, healthcare workers can also do this. And again, it's really a temporary measure just until somebody gets on the other side of that crisis so that they don't hurt themselves or someone else. We see time and time again after a mass shooting, people turn to mental health and say this is a mental health issue. But there are people that have mental health issues that never do anything like people. this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mental people with mental illness are actually at higher risk for being the victims mm -hmm. of violence. If you were to eliminate all bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression tomorrow, you would reduce major violence by less than 5%. Mm -hmm. So these people, yeah, they're emotionally disturbed. They might be angry, entitled, feeling entitled to something or someone, want revenge. Um, but that's not a psychiatric diagnosis. Are you troubled by, it seems we're hearing more and more, people trying to put the two together. It's true, we, we have issues with both, with mental health and with, and with gun violence. But shouldn't we be focusing on both as opposed to trying to put them both together? Yeah, these are parallel crises. Yes. Um, it's not necessarily that the mental health crisis is directly fueling gun violence. And if we're serious about addressing mental health, the biggest funder of mental health care in this country, um, particularly for these at-risk populations, is Medicaid. About half of states have yet, including Texas, have yet to expand Medicaid. So if we're really serious about mental health and mental health care, that's where we need to start. You know, a lot of people are trying to figure out what they can do in their own communities. And you, you say that there are ways that people can strategize, can legitimize their own, their own uh, basis of, of what they're doing to help with the gun violence issue. What are those? Well, there are community-based programs. So, for example, um, Cure Violence, Ceasefire, that focus on First, identifying who's at risk for being involved in gun violence, how to prevent the transmission of violence, because it really does function like an infectious disease. It transmits from person to person. How do you interrupt that transmission? And then how do you stabilize people? And a lot of gun violence is actually um, uh, fueled by people who have social and economic instability, which is actually how the pandemic is fueling gun violence. And so how do you stabilize people with respect to housing, with respect to jobs? These are the kinds of things that really do work in communities. You know, you always hear that phrase, guns don't kill people, people kill people. How do you, how do you look at that in the lens of, of public health? It's both. Uh, you know, again, using the, the um, analogy of infectious diseases, think about something like Zika or malaria. You have the infection, you have the mosquito, you have the person. I mean, similarly here, you don't have gun violence without both people and the gun. Exactly. Yeah, the gun is the vector, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Gowner. We appreciate you.